Thank you everyone for, for joining us and uh, congratulations to all of you uh, in the city of Tampa Bay. Um, so I just want to kick it over to, to Scott Gam. I think we'll be kind of a normal length today. I don't think it'll be extra short, but probably not particularly long, but there's a, a handful of things we want to be able to go through and kind of stay up to date on in these communications. So with that, I'll turn it over to my co-host, Scott Gam, who will drive for us today. All right, David, always happy to do it and great to be with you as always. And, you know, lots to talk about in the markets. We've got stocks up, a yield curve steepening, oil prices up. So, you know, like we usually do, just want to start off with your broader temperature on where things stand right now when you look at the broader markets and then when you look under the hood as well. Yeah, it really, it really is a, a, an odd market right now. And actually, I'll, I'll even kind of pull up where we are intraday because you and I are no strangers to having kind of triple digit moves on the days that we do this. And, and the markets are making some new all time highs as we speak across uh, the, the major indices. And, and it, 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 I think it's a surprise to a lot of people. Now, interestingly, um, the the market did have a bit of a sell off. Its first sort of downside volatility of any note at all in um, about almost three months, really from the end of October into the very end of January, and then coming out of the last couple of days of January, um, it's really recovered all that and then some. And and so it's difficult to sort of pick what macro theme and what market sensitive theme you think is most relevant. Um, because, of course, the most common question that a lot of the investors listening to the call right now want to know is, well, how long do you think this can keep going? And, and you know, that, that's a really difficult question to answer. But I do think the clients of the Bonson Group are blessed in this sense that we don't try to answer. Like, there's nothing worse than people that try to answer that question because they're making an answer up out of thin air, which I consider to be not just an inaccurate or, or a um, you know, potentially fallacious uh, method of investing capital, I consider it to be inherently dishonest, you know, just even pretending one may have the answer. The reality is that if I was just answering around feel, which isn't really all that helpful to anybody, the feel for a lot of people could have been that the markets were going to top out quite some time ago. And so the, the idea of sort of being able to time when things will kind of level off, I don't think is the real important thing to get to. The important thing to get to is this. Markets will correct. They will end up going until they want to kind of slow down a bit. And there will need to be some form of correction. And that correction will either be because of a, a catalyst, a, a news-oriented event, that, that kind of puts a little shock into the markets and, and the higher things are in valuation at the time, the quicker the correction will be because there won't be that margin for error. And then there may not be a catalyst. There may just simply be a kind of end of, of oxygen in the exhale. Uh, the markets just sort of kind of run out of that steam and, and end up needing to recalibrate to some degree on a technical basis. That happens all the time. These things are all very normal. And uh, I, I can't speak for every investor out there, but for the investors of the Bonson Group, it just simply isn't part of our investment policy or our investment methodology, our strategy, um, the, the manner in which returns will be generated do not come from being able to get in and out at, at highs and lows. So we're, we're a little less sensitive to that right now, but I would say we're probably in heightened sensitivity around where there may still be some deeper values, things that might still be somewhat disconnected from, from price. And I'm happy to talk about where some of those things may be because there's less of them than we used to be. You know, I used to have up on my screen, all of the, my, my screen shows the, the today's price and the volume and all the normal metrics. I show the year to date movement and then the 12 month uh, movement. And for the longest time, even as things had gotten better and better, there was still a 12 month backward look that had an awful lot of opportunities in, in various aspects of, of the equity markets. There's a lot less things right now that show as washed out uh, from where they were 12 months ago. Um, so we're, we're sensitive around that. And, and I think probably, Scott, you could guide me 
into some specifics that maybe we want to cover? Because I'll just sit here and talk the rest of the time. Well, no, I, I'd say a couple of things. One, let's talk about earnings, especially some of the beats we've seen in the financial sector. And then two, maybe we can shift uh, to the surge in oil prices. And then finally, uh, I think we should acknowledge some of the uh, heavily shorted stocks uh, that had been getting a lot of attention. We won't mention specific names, but I think everyone knows what we're talking about. Yeah, I would imagine they do. And if anyone doesn't, I just want to congratulate them because they, they've they uh, avoided some just, I don't know, b bizarre types of uh, things out there. Look, um, it's funny, if you if you, you don't know what he's talking about, like the names of the companies and the sort the story that it captured a lot, not just of the financial news cycle, but the total news cycle over the last couple of weeks, particularly two weeks ago, then it's almost sort of like in my living room last night where I had never heard of, or at least didn't know that I had ever heard of the halftime performer at the Super Bowl. Like sometimes you're just better off not knowing things, I guess. And, and I find that happening in pop culture more and more as I get older and significantly less cooler. And I already started off at a vantage point of being incredibly uncool. And it's just accelerating at this point. The thing you refer to with the shorting stock stuff, let me just start there to kind of get that done. It was a newsworthy story. I don't want to belittle it. And, and there were some interesting takeaways from it, but they're takeaways around excess and around human nature. And, and so what you got was just a total illustration of the insanity that takes place from one side of greed. And then you got an illustration of what takes place, the insanity of what takes place from another side of greed. And I don't mean greed as in those aspiring for investment returns, because I'm not critical of that. And that also isn't greed. I'm, I'm um, referring to those that are willing to be irrational and illogical and excessive in risk and thoughtless about risk in their pursuit of what they consider to be um, easy money. And we saw that from multiple actors at, in multiple positions around that kind of news event to which you refer. And I think it's mostly in the rear view mirror at this point. There's some things that will still get talked about. It probably is in everyone's best interest if Congress and the regulators and all those people just sort of flex and grandstand, which they're super good at doing and don't really do anything else, because I don't know really what can be done or, or, or should be done that wouldn't end up being um, uh, uh, perhaps more detrimental. So yeah, I think that we um, you know, are somewhat immune uh, to those types of things. And, and actually, I saw a question I imagine you're going to get to later. I did see a question that came up about the Bonson Group's use of alternatives. And if there's anything in particular about some of the short selling side, I wanna be able to talk about those two things in an, I wanna talk about that in two different ways. Because first of all, I do not, um, I believe that there's a certain lesson out of this on the short selling that is completely different from the broader application of where we use alternatives in the Bonson Group. Like I would never want to be invested with a, a hedge fund or an alternative strategy that was short 140% of the float of a given stock. You know, I do think that some hedge funders are psychopaths, but they're not, they don't usually get through my due diligence process. And, and if I mean psychopath in a, a complimentary way, which most people usually don't, you can write that down if you want. Um, I mean it only as a euphemism for someone who has this like incredibly laser focused process and competitiveness and, and whatnot. Not that they are being utterly reckless with the ABCs of risk management. So our view of the use of alternatives is completely separated from a couple isolated hedge funds um, just acting, you know, like I said, like, like psychopaths. Uh, but later on in our conversation, I'll come back to where I think alternatives still have uh, a great utility in the present environment, as strong of a usefulness in our process as they've ever had. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more about that later. I think, Scott, you had parts to your question before I, we got into that short selling you know, drama and story. 
and I got sort of distracted. So maybe bring me back to center here. Well, well, sounds good. And I think we'll, we'll leave that part of our conversation there, um, you know, uh, as this story continues. But yeah, David, to your point, the other things we wanted to discuss were some of the earnings we've been seeing over the past couple of weeks, particularly the beats in the financial sector. And then you've been mentioning energy uh, on these calls for quite some time. That's, uh, you know, a core sort of holding or area of the, the stocks you hold for clients. And I'm curious about your reaction to oil being back above sixty dollars a barrel. Yeah, I, I am. I'm pretty um, blown away by the speed of it. I'm not blown away by it happening. Um, I always believed it was obviously inevitable that supply and demand uh, forces would would have to kind of do what they do. But I think that um, pricing the the demand has not come back enough to single handedly warrant sixty dollar oil although I certainly think it's going to, and I certainly think prices do discount future, not present. But what's happened is that the greater than expected acceleration has not been on the demand side, but it's been on the reduced supply side. And it's a byproduct of the complexity of producing oil. First of all, Saudi, whether they're up to no good or not, I can't say, but they are going above and beyond what would have been expected and has been mathematically expected in their OPEC plus deal to decrease uh, supply, bring back supply demand into balance. And um, they've cut production an excess of million barrels a day beyond what was expected of them in this accord with the OPEC plus nations. And so I, I think that um, these, you have both factors that affect price, supply and demand, both working together to, to uh, push oil prices higher. But see, the other piece to it, I've written about this a little in the D.C. today, and I really think it's important for people to understand, this is not a situation where, well, you get supply low enough to let prices come back to provide that incentive to produce again, so then you can put supply back on when the margins are there because prices have recovered, and, and you think of it almost like the way you might with a bread line or, a, or manufacturing a widget. You know, there's that sort of dynamic and that tension in supply and demand with a lot of consumable items and, and a lot of individual products that play a part of a manufacturing assembly line it does not work that way with crude oil. You cannot just flick the switch, you know, um, to you, 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 sometimes you want to use your pool and, and, and it's gotten cool and because you weren't heating it and you say, OK, well, now I'm ready to use it. I want to turn the heater back on but the pool might take a long time to heat up. I just made that analogy up right now, so I have to think about if I like it or not. The problem is that with all of the rigs that have been taken offline, and I'm only referring right now to US production, to get all of these wells activated and, and get yield out of those efforts in the EMP side of things, it will take a very long time. And so they cannot just instantly ramp up production. And so that lag effect between supply and demand is a problem. You could end up getting really high prices in oil, but not for the right reason, not because there's so much economic growth and so much demand resurgence that then all of a sudden everyone's coming uh, you know, back online, pushing prices higher. It may just be that we have a legitimate supply shortage. And this is why I'm always beating the drum about the need for energy infrastructure investment and why I want to be levered to that energy infrastructure investment. Um, because I, I think when people look at the current events, like you go back to March and April of last year, and we remember that ridiculous day where there was so much excess oil and the forward contract was expiring and people are having to pay money to offload storage. So effectively looking like a cosmetic negative oil price for a day. And then now you look forward and you see the stockpiles are declining. I have a chart in DC today, today uh, showing this. All of the supply and demand factors are headed in the right direction, but I don't think that they can possibly get there quickly enough because of that sort of, back to my analogy of the timing of the heated pool. Um, the pool is gonna be needed well before it's heated up. And that's the problem on the supply side for US producers. And so these are tricky things and they become all the trickier when it is such a geopolitical story, an international story. 
But ultimately, I don't think we're going to be swimming in the world of $30 oil again. I think that right now they got it. They're, they're hoping to avoid $80 oil. And in terms of the regulation aspect, right, uh, I think I've heard you, you, you say in, in, in some of these previous calls that some of the larger EMPs out there may actually benefit from more regulation under the Biden administration. Yeah, I don't think that's the intention of the Biden administration, but I, I most certainly think that's the the effect. A lot of that is just a kind of macroeconomic principle. Um, I was brought up under a little rule of thumb that uh, regulation is a subsidy. And what that means is that regulation, which sometimes can be really needed, sometimes may not be as advisable, but that's not the point. Whether one likes the regulation or not, whoever is being regulated the smaller companies in the pool of regulated companies um, are hurt more by it. And therefore the regulation becomes a subsidy to the bigger companies because they have more means with which to, to deal with the regulation. And by means, I do mean financial resources, but out of that is the tax and the legal and the, and the consultants and the lobbyists and, and also the regulation as a cost is a smaller percentage to whatever it is for a larger body than it is to a smaller body. And so that impact it has to smaller bodies, which also, by the way, generally are more levered. They usually have more debt on their balance sheet. Um, it, it can create a uh, spiral effect where um, it really can, can put the smaller players out of business. And, and allow for an increase in market share. Um, the greatest example is post-financial crisis in the financial sector. There's just simply no debate that all of the large banks um, have gotten much larger and picked up significant amounts of market share and, and done so at the expense of a lot of the smaller uh, and regional banks. And so I do see a lot of that likely playing out in the energy sector. But the specifics of what regulations are coming in the energy sector are difficult to pinpoint right now. You've had a couple of executive orders that some of which are not immediately enforceable, some of which were a little bit more headline oriented than substance oriented. But, but we know that there is a, a, a broad based bias towards a higher regulation of the fossil fuel industry and in the new administration, and that there was a broad based bias against higher regulation in the fossil fuel industry in the prior administration. And, and so there is some lag effect as to when some of the prior deregulatory efforts can kind of go away in favor of new re-regulatory efforts. And I just don't think these things happen instantly. And, and it's not so easy to price it into equity markets. Hmm. Um, David, let's also talk about stimulus. What are your expectations for the potential of more fiscal stimulus coming and what that means for not just the economy, but the stock market as well? Yeah, I, um, the, I, I certainly expect that at this point, we, we, we know that a stimulus bill is going to uh, not only come, but will get passed. We've kind of always known that. And, and we now know that it does appear that they're going to go through with budget reconciliation as a means of getting it done, which is a, a procedural issue that will allow them to pass it with only 50 votes. Um, as opposed to needing a filibuster proof 60 votes. The catch to that is the only things that will be eligible to do this through budget reconciliation are things that are specific to a budget. So revenue items such as tax rates and then expenditure items that are a matter of government spending from, from their actual treasury, which is the bulk of what this is. But there are some things that have already have to be crossed out. And, and one of those things that was in the initial bill that now um, over the weekend, the Biden administration has said, yeah, we're not gonna be able to really include it, was that $15 an hour federal minimum wage aspect because it can't go through on uh, a budget reconciliation process. Um, by the way, just from a kind of partisan versus nonpartisan standpoint, I'm not really here to say anything positive or negative about the use of budget reconciliation. 
Um, I don't I don't really care that the Bush administration used reconciliation. The Obama administration used it. The Trump administration used it. This goes back for for decades. So it, this isn't like, oh, it was a bad thing to use or a good thing to use. It's just what every party does when they're able to do it to some degree. The only noteworthy thing about it politically is I do think there are 10 senators, Republican, that would have voted yes, probably much more than 10, that would have voted yes on a bill that the Biden administration would have liked a lot. And so that would have given this opportunity for this kind of, even if it's somewhat symbolic, a sort of bipartisan bill that would have not had to go through reconciliation. Um, but, you know, that that bill may not have had all of the the things in it, the bells and whistles that, that they want. And, the, and so that that's fine. But um, the interesting thing, Scott, for those paying attention over the weekend, it was really kind of Thursday night that the Washington Post ran this story from Larry Summers is an op ed. Larry Summers was the Treasury Secretary at the end of Bill Clinton's presidency, and he was uh, the National Economic Council director under Barack Obama, who wrote the first stimulus bill that President Obama passed back in 2009. And he's been a kind of you know centerpiece as, a, as the sort of Democratic Party intellectual heft around economic policy for most of my adult life. You know, he's, he's a neo-Keynesian, he's a significant thinker, just a lot that he um, puts out that I happen to disagree with and a lot that I find really invigorating and interesting. And I've had the occasion to, to sit with him and talk one-on-one -on -one economics on a couple of occasions. And he's a, a really very interesting guy to engage with. But he wrote an op-ed kind of critical of the bill. And again, on the merits of the policy side, people can agree with some of what he said, disagree. That's actually not why I'm bringing it up. I bring it up because you would think that that could then produce a political environment that forces them to back down a little bit and lower the size of it. And what's interesting is I'm not sure that's what's happening. I know some Republicans have used Summers op-ed suggesting that the bill is too big and needs to be watered down a little uh, because of its excesses and so forth. Some Republicans have used that over the weekend, but for the most part, it does appear the Biden administration is kind of digging their heels in a little They've they've uh, expressed uh, uh, acceptance that there's some legitimate points in Summers' pushback, but that they think they've dealt with those, accounted for them, sort of want to go forward. So on the margin, what I have guessed when the Republican bipartisan effort came out with a six hundred billion dollar counter to the Biden proposal, one point nine trillion, would I have thought we were going to get to one point two or one point three trillion in the middle there? No, I still thought it was going to favor closer to what the president wants. But then with Summers' article, would I have thought it would have come down a bit? Yes. But now, are we talking about it coming down $200 billion or $600 billion? That, that's, a, that's a lot of money in between there, and I'm not really sure of the answer. So far, the only thing I can tell that looks pretty clear that Biden is going to, excuse me, President Biden is going to have to capitulate on is the aid the income bracket for who gets the the direct payment to taxpayers? If you recall, they had done uh, two thousand dollars payments back in the spring, um, just to anyone single, married, under a certain income level, and it was up to two hundred thousand for a married couple. Then they did the six hundred dollars one with this nine hundred billion dollar bill back in December, and now Biden had said, "I want to do." $1,400 more to get up to the 2000 that had been discussed earlier, up to $300,000 of income for a married couple without any financial hardship or anything. Now the dollar amount starts to tear down, but the point is there's just sort of a direct payment. And it does look like he, he's not going to be able to get even enough Democrat support at that income level. They're going to have to teeter that down but I don't think the fiscal impact of that is more than 100 billion or so. So we're, we're still looking at a pretty sizable package that's probably going to get passed within about a month and get done so through budget reconciliation. And I think there'll be some things in it that are effective and, and, and some things even needed. And I do think there'll be some things in it. And I've said this about all the bills that took place with the prior administration as well. I'm, I'm not being remotely partisan here. There are some things in it that I think are just completely absurd. Let's also use this as a jumping off point to discuss 
inflation versus deflation, which was the subject of some of your uh, recent Dividend Cafe commentaries. Uh, curious, kind of your overall takeaway and, and what you want people to know about the risks of inflation, especially coming off of all the stimulus that we're expected to get. Yeah, the, that subject is near and dear to my heart. Um, I did a little two-part Dividend Cafe on it a few weeks ago. And, and I really do um, want people to understand that th there is a harmony between the belief that you can and will have inflation for certain periods of time in certain prices with, and at the same time believe that the broader secular pressure is disinflationary or deflationary. And that's exactly what my view is. So, so the notion that housing prices are inflating um, or that healthcare costs had been inflating or that college tuition had been inflating, I think that those were inflationary items, all with some form of subsidy attached to them in the midst of what had primarily been a, a, a very low inflation type environment. I don't speak about deflation to suggest that purchasing power goes down over time. What I mean by it is a period in which the bias in the economy as reflected in bond yields becomes the opposite of inflationary, which is disinflationary. And so it plays out more in a low, slow, and no growth environment, very similar to what we've seen in Japan uh, for, for a few decades. And, and that, that is a um, really important uh, thing to understand in how we weight asset classes in a, in a portfolio. Um, now, the problem that we face right now is it's entirely possible you will get some cyclical inflation in the midst of secular deflation. And what I mean by that is prices that will rise this year uh, out of the big uh, increase in the monetary base, out of a reflation in commodity prices and other things, most of which has already played out. Okay, the, the, it was not hard to reflate prices, commodity prices off of what took place last spring, but then they had a big rebound higher. And you've seen that in, in lumber, building materials, you know, anyone building a house right now with construction prices is, is well aware of what price inflation they've seen there. And yet, the two things that really people have to understand to try to take this kind of subjectivity out of this and, and also to take the speculation out of it is the, um, whether you're using the CPI or the personal consumption expenditures that the Fed uses, you still have sub 2% growth in, in the price level. And, and I am well aware of the criticisms out there, but yeah, it doesn't factor in this, doesn't factor in that. They're not perfect. None of them are perfect. And the only reason those measures aren't perfect is not conspiratorial or sinister, right? although some people do believe that. Um, the reason is because it can't be perfect because there is no such thing as an aggregate price level and I think in Dividend Cafe a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this in the context of there being no such thing as an aggregate weather level. And if there was, if you did actually do the work to take the average temperature across every zip code in the country, it would be worth exactly nothing, you know, uh, because of all that matters is the, the specific uh, impact in your own environment. And the same is really true of price level as well. So... I guess what I want to get at on this is that bond yields have to move higher for it to matter if people believe that there is inflation. And, and bond yields are not simply responding to the belief that there isn't inflation. Bond yields are telling you that there isn't inflation. Okay. That, and, and the bond market is that effective and that powerful of a market signal. And, and you're talking about many, many trillions of dollars. There are absolute central bank distortions embedded in there, but where monetary policy lies and has always lied is on the short end of the curve. What monetary policy cannot do is uh, substantially influence the longer end of the curve and where you would start seeing inflation expectations. So we look to tip spreads. Inflation expectations are higher than they were a year ago, but a year ago they were looking at the world ending, and now they're not. 
And so inflation's come up a, a moderate amount. But fundamentally, my belief is that the uh, massive, excessive amount of debt, both in absolute dollar terms, nominal dollar terms, and as a percentage of GDP, has taken away the ability to use deficit spending to grow the economy, that it has had enough diminishing return um, that you end up getting into this deflationary spiral and you need ongoing low rates to combat what has taken place from having low rates. And, and that is, to me, the spiral that we're in in a more broad and secular sense. So with that dynamic then, David, what is the sort of investing playbook, right? I, I guess that might be a good seg segue into the growth versus value conversation that you've also written a lot about in the Dividend Cafe commentaries. I think that, that if one believed the tremendous inflationary pressures were coming and we were going to see a 5% yield in the 10 year again it would you would really want to be selling with both hands anything you have with high pe ratios and and high amount of quote unquote growth stocks but see i don't believe that yet i do believe what i think is a pretty logical assumption that is also not quite real bullish on on high valuation stocks which is even though I don't believe those yields are going um, significantly higher and undermining the PE ratios of all these high value uh, growth stocks, I also don't believe they're going lower, right? I think a big part of the increase in valuation came from the journey, the journey down of, of bond yields and, and valuations going higher and now we've sort of flatlined in there, and yet I'm predicting that we stay in that flatline. So then what you get is no, um, you get a real compression of growth, and yet it, you don't get a skyrocketing reversal either. So that's why I'm not being apocalyptic about it. I'm just simply saying that I think that the dependency on a higher market multiple is one that is kind of run uh, its course and at some point probably results in a repricing of some of those very expensive assets. Now, the, the first investment implication, Scott, we have to start with is actually not even in the growth value discussion or any part of equity markets. It is what one does on the bond market side. And this is so much of what we have focused our operation magnify around and so practical to where we are and are not, um, allocating in the fixed income, whether it be credit or what we call boring bonds, just sort of generic high grade treasury bonds, municipal bonds, investment grade corporates, is if one believes that those yields are going from 1% to 3%, they probably want to be selling everything. If one believes they're going from 1% to 0% or to negative 2%, maybe they just want to back up the truck and, and buy a whole bunch of of 10-year bonds at 1%. And if one believes that we're just sort of stuck in that mode, then, then they have to kind of view it as a sort of no return, but not as a significant imminent risk asset class. Therefore, if that's the conclusion one draws, and I'm in that latter camp, um, back to the earlier question about alternatives, not in the context of short selling in the recent news um, hysteria, but I believe that most people's equity allocation was probably already set within a certain bandwidth of nearness to their comfort level. And therefore, if one needs to, to deliver a return that they're no longer going to get from the fixed income asset class, it probably suggests some reallocation out of bonds into fixed income, given that inflation deflation dynamic. Hmm. Uh, let's also, David, just because you, you brought it up again, uh, the news surrounding short selling, a parallel news story with that has been the surge in cryptocurrencies. And, you know, this morning we got news that a, a very well-known electric vehicle maker would be purchasing some cryptocurrency. Um, got a lot of attention. We've been getting some questions about it from people writing in. Uh, Somebody wants to know if you think other companies will follow that decision that we saw this morning from the electric vehicle maker uh, and your just sort of broader thoughts on cryptocurrency. 
I, I actually don't, but it is possible. Even in this particular case, they they um, revealed in a regulatory filing that they had put something in between five and seven percent of their massive amount of corporate cash into digital or crypto form. So it was still um, what seems to be on a headline, a high dollar amount, but as a percentage, it was really quite small. Um, but also just the nature of this company is pretty iconoclastic. The CEO likes to troll, he likes to tweet, he likes to mess with people. He, he has long positions in the digital currencies himself. So it's not illegitimate, it's not invalid. It is relevant and worth following, but you really got to see so a, a pattern before you can call it a pattern. And, and we're not there yet. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that the notion of other um, companies following suit would be interesting, but it would not change anything fundamental or, or non-fundamental uh, about the existence. Look, we um, you, all it's going to take with corporate cash, most companies, and the one we're discussing here right now is not one of them, have very, very specific and tight mandates about what they can do with corporate cash. Like they're not even allowed to buy high yield bonds with their corporate cash because it undermines the credit characteristics of what they have to do. And so it's very, very tight what, they, what they're required. Well, you're talking about with crypto, an asset class that goes up and down 30% all the time, for let alone 2 to 7%, you know? So I, I have a hard time believing that will be a particular catalyst just around the normal responsibility mandates of, of corporate cash stewardship in corporate America. But this company this morning is an exception to the rule. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, it's pretty incredible. And also to see the reaction. I mean, you're, you're seeing folks come out and say that this sort of gives a, a, a new case for cryptocurrency, sort of a new, a new layer on the onion, if you will, that, that was not previously being talked about. Well, and I suppose um, if the thesis is that there would be a whole lot of increased demand in corporate America for cash reserves, to go into a digital form that it would push the, the demand higher while supply does not go higher and therefore push the price up. But there's, there's a lot of assumptions in that that are not true. Um, the, the supply side for one, um, there, there is an infinite amount of uh, these companies that can come online. Um, I'm not, I, I, I would just say that it's hard for us to get into it here in this particular thesis. There's no reason for anyone to be bearish on where the price of uh, these cryptos are going to go um, because it's so highly speculative. I, I, there is not any fundamental way to measure off of a, a sort of internal rate of return assumption. Um, what, what I think people can make decisions based on what we already know, which is that within a uh, recent 12-month period, it's had a parabolic move higher Within a 12-month period that was not too far removed from recent history before that, it had had a, I believe, 80% peak to trough drop. So there's a sort of roller coaster dynamic to it. Right now, it's been on more of the fun part of the roller coaster. It's had in the other side as well. And I think it's going to continue to do that for a lot of different reasons. And at some point in the process, also get to meet regulators. Well, it's certainly something we'll be watching uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months, because, uh, you know, I guess as the saying goes, what goes up must come down. But uh, for right now, we're just talking about the first part of that phrase. Uh, David, let's also talk about, and I think we'll keep it very simple, top three things to be concerned about in the markets right now. And, and it may very well be some of the, you know, quote unquote, euphoria we've been seeing in various stocks or cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I, I had made some notes this morning that are going to be in DC today today. Um, if we were to get a negative earnings season, that was by negative, I mean, uh, relative to expectations later on into the year, I think that would be really problematic. But the inverse is equally true. And one of the totally underrated realities of what's happening in markets right now 
Um, and we're going to get a whole lot more companies that announced this week, but we are over 50%. I think we were at 57% of the S&P 500 had announced results coming into today. And you were at 1.1% revenue growth for this quarter's reported results versus a year ago. And you were at 2.4% earnings growth this quarter for where we were a year ago. And of course, we're, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and, and significant parts of the economy not even fully reopened. Um, the biggest aspect, though, is not on the margin 1% and 2% growth in both top line and bottom line versus a year ago. The biggest aspect is what had been priced into expectations, and the financial sector has outperformed earnings expectations by about 20%, and technology has outperformed by about 18%. Materials, we talked about some price reflation that's gone on, have done uh, similar, I think, high teens relative to expectations on earnings, on bottom line profit results. That's a big deal. And it's pretty hard for markets to go down when those kind of upside surprises are coming. But that, that will be hard to repeat throughout the year. I'm, I'm, I, I think that's noteworthy. So when you talk about kind of three things that should be shared, um, I continue to believe that there is the potential for something with um, uh, China to surprise global markets, some sort of negative development in negotiations with the Biden administration and, and uh, Chinese uh, authorities, some sort of economic disappointment that comes from China itself. We know what a large uh, role it plays in global GDP growth. There's some things that linger out there with China, and, and I don't want to take my eye off of that ball. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, I think you know the third thing I kind of talk about probably too much, and I know some people get annoyed with me about it, but I, I don't think you can ignore the fact that valuations don't leave a lot of margin for error. It has not mattered this last week, and it did not matter most of January. It mattered part of January, but... It certainly didn't matter in, in most of the post-COVID recovery. Um, but, you know, at some point it could matter. And, and that in that environment, I, I suspect you'll see some repricing of equities. But I also suspect it will not be universal, that it will be more rotational than, than universal in the way that that impacts markets. And um, right now, when I look at price action, some of the things that were most distressed out of COVID, financials and energy have really recovered a lot. Um, a lot of things are still doing pretty well, and they had done incredibly well, you know, last year, as we know, in technology, consumer discretionary, some high beta sectors. But things that have really continued to kind of hum along and not fully participate on a valuation level and have not generated a whole lot of interest and flows coming in are some of the more boring sectors I'm not using the word value because that's not really the context that we're talking about. I'm more referring to just the popularity, but I think consumer staples, utilities, um, the, the, uh, some of the REITs, you know, these things still seem to me to be pretty underappreciated uh, from a valuation standpoint. So there's an opportunity for investors to, to be well positioned for that eventual rotation, but regardless of how one wants to be positioned, they shouldn't be unaware Though that risk exists around a repricing of high valuation. Well, and we saw, you know, a, a minor pullback in valuations uh, about ten days ago or so, uh, w when we saw, uh, I guess, the the frenzy around the heavily shorted stocks, I guess, bleed into the broader market. But even that was just a very short-lived, minor pullback. Yeah, I mean, if you look uh, at just on a market index level, which is easier for me to talk about on this call than individual stocks, um, year to date, the Dow is only up a little over 2%, and the S&P is only up um, a little uh, under 4%. It's still pretty good. Um, the, the NASDAQ's up over 8%. Small cap is up over 15%, and that's in the first 38 days of the year. Um, but going back 12 months, which includes all of the COVID drop, you know, we're pretty close to where we were at, at market highs a year ago. I think it was actually right near Valentine's Day weekend a year ago. 
Uh, the Nasdaq's up 47% from a year ago, and, and the Russell 2000s up 35%. The S&P's up 17. Um, and so it, I think you're right that there, there could be a little, you know, that move a couple weeks back, like the Dow went down 600 points on a Friday or something on a percentage basis. That's really not what I re would refer to as what is capable of repricing. When you look at these price levels and whatever earnings have taken place in the time period of that price movement, you've gotten a multiple movement. And that multiple move um, has been really, really significant, uh, far outpaced the movement of the underlying earnings. And that's the area that I would be watching as it pertains to risk around valuation. Well, David, we know you're going to have more comments on the markets in today's DC today. Why don't you give us a, a little preview of what's to come? Yeah, I do. I think DC today is a pretty full one. I had a, a, a good amount of time to, to work on it this morning with some COVID updates and, and a little more unpacking of some of the um, public policy environment. Um, kind of got into some trade deficit economic data because a lot of the sort of annual numbers had come out. And, and I thought it was important to revisit where we stand there. So it's, you know, I always want to have a little bit of each of the major categories, but uh, today might have a little more than normal there. Um, so, you know, at this point, my view on markets is very well known. I, I, I do just don't deny that there's this general feeling of things seem to be rather frothy and whatnot. But um, I, am, I am surprised by the people that themselves felt that way like 10,000 points ago, and they're still beating the drum. You know, usually it kind of rotates, right? And I don't know what, I don't know what to say other than um, market timers just uh, really end up suffering immensely. Um, it's, it's a dangerous game to play. I would love to play it. I really would. I, I, it would make my life a lot easier if um, I thought it could be played well but I don't think it can be played well. And, and I think that what really needs to happen is in the context of one's um, financial situation, it's just very important that the macroeconomic realities, we talked about bond yields, the, the, our role of using alternatives, um, you know, the income generation, uh, obviously ourselves as dividend growth investors, not only do I feel really good about the price reality of what we're seeing in, in our stocks right now, but I also feel very good about that embedded income growth. So the, when the market lets off a little steam or then adds a little steam, those type of things don't affect what we're looking to do on behalf of clients. It, it just couldn't. And, and uh, so we, we're pretty disciplined around our process and I'm always happy to elaborate more on what that looks like. So I, I'll, I'll let us close out here, Scott. Thanks so much for all your very thoughtful questions today. And, I know we ended up going a little longer than, than uh, I had said, but hopefully you all got something out of it. Um, Erica, why don't you go ahead and dismiss us and we'll look to come back to you all in two weeks. Thanks, David. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you.